So to use uh, Gordon Lightfoot's words, I'm on the shores of the great Gitchagumi and uh, Lake Superior. And I'm trying to visualize the voyageurs who have about three months ago left Quebec City. And at this point, they've passed Fort St. Joseph and they're on their way to the, the, to the Great Portage at the end of Superior. And uh, I'll tell you, they were brave souls indeed. In fact, when they would have to, uh, when they get to a point of land, obviously they couldn't follow the shoreline because that would extend their trip by hundreds of miles. So sometimes they'd have to cross between points in huge expanses. And because they'd integrated themselves with the native culture, they would stop at that point, probably have their tea, have a pipe, and then they'd spread tobacco on the waters of the Gitchagumi and pray for a safe passage from point to point. And uh, yeah, they were pretty rugged craft, but uh, it's still pretty frightening to think of it. So while I'm on the subject of uh, Fort St. Joseph, it, uh, there are his everything has history. And a wee bit of history about the fort at St. Joseph's Island. It, um, it has more than its fair share. And, and I'm gonna get into that in a second. So the island first becomes a mission for the Jesuits in the 1680s. And for almost 80 years, this little outpost in the middle of nowhere in the Northwest is, is garrisoned with priests, um, soldiers, uh, a lot of natives. They're trading primarily with the Potawatomi and the Miami natives at this point. And again, it, it's a popular spot for trade because if you look at the Lake Huron waters on the north end, the uh, Manitoulin Island and a series of islands like Drummond Island, which plays a role in history a little later on, are a protective barrier for the voyagers plying their way to the Grand Portage. Uh, the French at this time have pretty much integrated themselves with the indigenous people. They have neither need nor want of land. Uh, and unlike the, their uh, uh, English counterparts uh, who take a more dominating or domineering role towards the natives and they are land hungry. So, you know, the relationship, if you would, all the French wanted was this solid fur trading relationship with the natives. And a lot of that took place on this little island uh, at the northern end of Lake Huron. So Fort St. Joseph's has this crazy colorful history. In 1771, during the French and Indian Wars, it comes under the control of the British. So down comes the French flag, up goes the British flag. Uh, then it, this leads to the 1763 Pontiac Uprising. At that point, down comes the British flag and up goes the French flag. Now the flag flies there till uh, 1769. And then we have an even weirder bit of history as the uh, Spanish governor in St. Louis uh, gets a contingent of French and natives together and they take the fort. So, and they're there for all of one day. Now, I, I don't know if they flew a flag, but I'm pretty sure they did. So down comes the French flag and up goes the Spanish flag. And the history just gets more colorful from there. So we're gonna fast forward now to the American Revolution. Uh, the wars fought, the wars won by the Americans. The Paris, or Treaty of Paris is signed in uh, in 1783. Now the British are manning an, a, an outpost on, on uh, Michilimackinac, known as Michilimackinac, and, and they're now on British, they're now on American soil. So they're ordered to get out. Well, just like Fort Detroit and other forts, they, they were a wee bit slow in exercising that, that move. And, and in fact, it took them 13 years before they left. But now the British realize that they need, in order to maintain the trade with the natives, they need the British Indian Department's influence on the British side, and they also need it for defense. So they choose uh, St. Joseph Island to construct a new fort, and the very site that Kathy and I walked on this morning. So 1796, work begins on the blockhouse and the palisade. Uh, by 1797, they're working on the uh, uh, other buildings within it, and by the end of uh, 
the following year they've completed everything, the bakehouse, the blacksmith shop, and they've garrisoned it. Uh, and also they have a contingent from the British Indian Department, as I mentioned, to ensure that they maintain that trade and relationship with the natives. So the War of 1812 breaks out, and this is a very unpopular war. Nobody wants this war, but the United States of America declare war in Great Britain. Now at the time, uh, Charles Roberts, Captain Charles Roberts, is the commander at, at Fort St. Joseph and a fellow by the name of Lieutenant uh, Porter Hanks is in command of Michilimackinac. So now Roberts realizes that the best defense may be, he knows his fort's vulnerable, so he takes an approach, the best defense is to take the offense. So on July the 17th, 1812, he takes 40 of his regulars, 150 Canadians, and approximately 300 native allies load themselves into dozens and dozens of canoes and they make their way across in the dark to Michilimackinac. And they work through the night and they position a six pound cannon up on the hill overlooking the, the, their powder magazine inside the palisade walls. Robert simply goes up to the front door and he knocks on it. Now, now Hanks has no idea war has been declared. And Robert says to him, he says, I love this part. He goes, I think you should surrender the fort. And he goes, well, what for? He says, well, you declared war on us and we're taking the fort. But what didn't take Hanks long to take a look over his shoulder with a keen eye and see a cannon that could hit his powder magazine and that he was severely outnumbered. So the fort was surrendered without a shot. And you might say that the Americans aren't off to a very auspicious start because now they've lost the complete northwest, if you would, of the territory and the trade and everything else that goes with it. And uh, that's a wee bit of history about uh, Fort Joseph. Uh, and if you've been following along, you'll know that I'm thinking of building a fort. So I'm, between here and the Yukon River, Kathy and I are hitting every single fort we can. This one didn't have much to look at other than the foundations, but historically a very significant site. and. Uh, Anyway, that's a wee bit of history. And I got some ground to cover because the Yukon's a long way away and we've been inundated with forest fires up here. So we're kind of skirting around them. We've been lucky so far, but we got a long way to go.